Growing up, I was always told about this idea of fun of Allah, or being one with Allah. I'd say to myself, God, you are my Everest, and I will climb that mountain of life without ever resting just to reach you. See, God was the mountain peak, something I had to spend my life trying to get to. God was one, and I was two, creating this kind of duality, not really understanding the true reality. See, la ilaha illallah means there is no God but God. Take that in though. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but God. One more time. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but God. There is no being but God, no existence but the existence of God. See, God wasn't just the mountain peak but my ice pick. God's the shoes I would use to try and get to the top. God's the rope I'd hold on to just in case I drop. God is the entire mountain and not just the highest spot. Shoot, God's everything the universe holds, the whole lot. And this idea of funafilah is not about two entities becoming one, but understanding that there are none. None but Allah. Ibn Arabi said, the true goal is this realization that there is no existence but that of God alone and all them philosophers and mystics and poets have known it's a constant exploration to try and understand God and his creation. But the great ones, the great ones have always spoken about the true search coming from within but will looking at the man in the mirror give me a clear picture of what I'm searching for? All this time I've been looking out at the night sky through a telescope should I have been looking inside through a microscope? And how can I see God through my eyes and my lens? Don't I need God's glasses just to see him? If there's no existence but God, no duality, then is God me? Will this inner contemplation, trying to understand every revelation, be the way in which I take in this true reality? I don't know. All I do know is Allah. You are hidden gems concealed within a treasure chest. And every disclosure gets me closer to understanding my Everest. Thank you. Thank you. 
is my anchor. Like words to a poet or moves to a dancer, my faith is my anchor. When the world's expectations are too high, I know I can sit down and look up to the sky, and he'll be there, ready to reply. He is the first and the last, the sun and the moon, the effervescent light that shines bright in the gloom. I know he'll be there, whether I am wrong or right, and he will be the one to hold my hand through life. Because if not for him, I would live in fear every day. L-I-F-E, live in fear every day. That's what my life would stand for, and the wind would wisp me away. I am a flower that grows with his words, devoted to devotion, and I will never turn. He is the sand in the hourglass of hope, and when I think I've fallen, he hands me a rope. So I ask, what is faith? The answer I seek to find, but then I look into his eyes and know that's where the answer lies. For 17 years he's been by my side in my moments of despair to my feelings of pride. So I look up to him, but I know he is right by my side. I am the student. He is the teacher. I am the listener. He is the preacher. I am the butterfly. He is the cocoon. It is him who sets me free to grow. He gives me room. See, this world is a sinful abyss. Materialism tramples realism, and faith is slowly missed. But we must hang on in these tough times, because everything is written. He is the author of our lives. So I am unaware of what my next chapter states, but I know through his words he will show me the way. His hand is on my shoulder to guide me back to the right path when I fall astray. I am blind, but he helps me to see. And in the words of the great Rumi, only from the heart can you touch the sky. So my heart reaches out to you, O oh divine. Your mind is deep like the ocean. You make sure that I am never blue. And in the time of your diamond jubilee, you are the brightest shining diamond. And I sincerely love you. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam has said, Truly, Ali is from me, and I am from him, and he is the wali of every believer after me.
मुझसे जुड़ा कतराए नूर हूँ मैं तुझ में मिलना मकसद मेरा through his actions and through the results obtained by the institutions that he has founded and encouraged and nourished, he has become a light in much of the world's conflicting darkness. The Aga Khan, he's one of the most fascinating people who I've, I've ever met. He's like a head of state without a country. He's a religious leader. He's also doing some of the most important charitable work in the Islamic world. I am fascinated and sometimes frustrated. When representatives of the Western world, especially the Western media, try to describe the work of our Aga Khan Development Network in fields like education, health, the economy, media, and the building of social infrastructure, reflecting a certain historical tendency of the West to separate the secular from the religious. They often describe it either as philanthropy or entrepreneurship. What is not understood is that this work is for us a part of our institutional responsibility. It flows from the mandate of the office of the Imam to improve the quality of worldly life for the concerned communities. Your Highness, if a complete stranger who had no idea who you were or what you were came up to you and said, what do you do for a living? What would be your reply? I would say that my role is uh, I'm the hereditary imam of a Shia Muslim community, an international Shia Muslim community. My family and myself trace our family line back to the Prophet and uh, accepted therefore by the community as the imams. And an imam in Islam is responsible for the security of the people who refer to him, he's responsible for the interpretation of faith, and he's responsible for their quality of life. To understand this dimension of the religious office I hold, 
one must appreciate that Islam encompasses both the spiritual and the secular. The two are so deeply intertwined that one cannot imagine this separation or their separation. This unity underpins an unrelenting effort towards an equitable order where the vulnerable are helped to regain the dignity of self-fulfillment. As you build your lives for yourselves and others, you will come to rest upon certain principles. Central to my life has been a verse in the Holy Quran which addresses itself to the whole of humanity. It says, O mankind, fear your Lord, who created you of a single soul, and from it created its mate, and from the pair of them scattered abroad many men and women. This remarkable verse speaks both of the inherent diversity of mankind and of the unity of mankind, the single soul created by a single creator, the spiritual legacy which distinguishes the human race from all other forms of life. I know of no more beautiful expression about the unity of our human race, born indeed from a single soul. Thank you. Ya Ali Madad, welcome, bienvenue, and happy new year. Thank you for tuning in to another Friday Night Reflections. My name is Deborah Samani, and I'm honored to welcome all of our Jamaati members, multi-faith family members, and everyone tuning in from across the globe. I'm coming to you from Edmonton, and I'm so excited to be hosting tonight as we kick off the first few weeks of 2021. I hope you had a good week and a chance to take a break over the new year. We baked a lot and ate a lot of those baked goods in my house, but we were able to get out and do some sledding, skating, played some hockey, and went for many family walks with our two dogs to balance out our indulgence. I hope you enjoyed the pre-show of some of the talented artists at the Jubilee Arts Festival. And now let's take a look at the program tonight. I'm excited to welcome back Alwais Hussein Trania. Many of you will remember Hussein from his webinar on being an ambassador of Islam. Tonight's session carries on in the same theme. Many of us are asked questions about the faith in the community and may struggle to find the right answer. As someone who has embraced the Ismaili faith, I have posed many of these questions to our family and friends, and I know firsthand experience that these are difficult questions to answer. I attended the Jamaati Ambassador Program and have performed many Sabre opportunities over the last 20 years so that I can learn and grow and be better able to articulate our faith and my choice to be a Shia Imami Ismaili Muslim. Tonight, Alwaz Hussein will take us back to some of those questions and help us all to articulate answers to these questions. Alwaz Hussein Trania has volunteered with various Jamaati and Aga Khan Development Network institutions within Canada and abroad in countries such as Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and India. He is currently the member for youth and young adults in ITRIP Canada and the lead of the ambassador program for community relations portfolio on the Council for Canada. Professionally, Hussein graduated from the University of Waterloo in computer science and currently leads technology efforts for Beesurance, an insured tech startup in Calgary, while exploring other areas of business and entrepreneurship. Welcome, Hussein. Hussein, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a privilege to have you with us. With the increased visibility of the community, we often received questions about who the Ismailis are, who is the Aga Khan, what is the Aga Khan Development Network, and other such inquiries. So it's great to have you here to help us and uh, think through and articulate responses to some of these questions to help others have a better understanding and that we can all become uh, better ambassadors for our community and our faith. Today, we're going to go through questions that have frequently been posed to us and uh, have you help us with the responses. Does that sound all right? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, 
thank you for having me. And um, I'll try my best to share thoughts on some of these questions and um, also to draw on clips from videos or speeches um, from Molana Hazri Mam that um, touch on some of these questions. And um, one thing that I might say just at the very beginning is to, for all of us to just keep in mind that um, generally there isn't a one size fits all answer for questions because questions really depend on the context of how, when and where they're being asked. Um, but with that in mind, um, as mentioned, we'll try our best and hopefully what everyone hears will be helpful today. That sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. Our first question is a common one. I know a bit about the Ismailis as I have friends who are Ismaili, but I'm not quite sure what this means. Can you help me understand who the Ismailis are and whether they are different from other Muslims? Great question and uh, a common one for sure. Um, so let's start with actually a clip from Hazri Imam and this was a speech that he gave to the parliament here in Canada. The Ismaili Imamate is a supranational entity representing the succession of Imams since the time of the Prophet. But let me clarify something more about the history of that role in both the Sunni and the Shia interpretations of the Muslim faith. The Sunni position is that the Prophet nominated no successor and that spiritual moral authority belongs to those who are learned in matters of religious law. As a result, there are many Sunni Imams in a given time and in a given place. But others believed that the Prophet had designated his cousin and son-in-law, Ali, as his successor. From that early division, a host of further distinctions grew up. But the question of rightful leadership remains central. In time, the Shia were also subdivided over these questions, so that today the Ismailis are the only Shia community who throughout history have been led by a living hereditary imam in direct descent from the Prophet. The role of the Ismaili imam is a spiritual one. His authority is that of religious interpretation. It is not a political role. I do not govern any land. At the same time, Islam believes fundamentally that the spiritual and material worlds are inextricably connected. Faith does not remove Muslims or their Imams from daily practical matters in family life, in business, in community affairs. So you see that Mohan has your mom clearly talked about and articulated the difference between the Shia interpretation and the Sunni interpretation of Islam. Um, all Muslims believe in one God, Allah, which means God in Arabic, and believe in Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him and his progeny. The Shia believe that before the Prophet passed away, he designated a successor to lead the Ummah after him, and that that successor was Hazrat Ali, may peace be upon him. And there's actually quite um, a bit that could be said about this relationship between Hazrat Ali and the Prophet. Hazrat Ali was the Prophet's first cousin. He grew up in the home of the Prophet. And as we know, um, Hazrat Ali was given the honor of marrying the beloved daughter of the Prophet, Bibi Fatima, and peace be upon her. Thanks, Hussein. Yes, it's really important for us to be able to uh, understand that differentiation and that we are Shia Ismaili Muslims. Yeah, exactly. Um, Ismailis are Shia, and there's, as mentioned by Hazrat Imam, there's many communities uh, within the larger Shia community. And so the the largest in terms of numbers are the Twelvers, and uh, that's a Shia community that after Hazrat Ali believed that there were 11 more Imams, and the belief is that there 
twelfth imam is currently hidden from the physical world. Uh, another Shia community are the Mustali Ismailis, and one of the sub communities, which is um, perhaps commonly known, are the Boras. And the Bohoras are also um, a community that believe that their imam is currently hidden, but is guiding their dais, um, and their dais are leading the the community. And of course, there is the Nizari Ismaili community, um, commonly known as the Ismailis. And as Malana has your mom indicated, um, the Ismailis are the only Shia community that has always been led by a Hazar Imam or a physically present Imam that descends from the Prophet through Bibi Fatima and Hazrat Ali. And we are so lucky and so blessed for that. Thank you so much for sharing. And this gives rise to our second question. Since Ismailis and other Shias believe that the Imams are successors to the Prophet Muhammad, does that mean your Imam is like a Prophet to you? Actually, it's really important to differentiate between the two, between prophets and imams. So all Muslims believe in the many prophets that came before Prophet Muhammad, such as Abraham or Ibrahim, Moses or Musa, Jesus or Isa, may peace be upon all of them. And the belief is that Prophet Muhammad May peace be upon him and his progeny was the final and last prophet and therefore the last to receive revelation. The Shia belief in Imamath is that it is the Imam who has the rightful authority and knowledge to interpret that revelation and to apply that interpretation for the current day and time. Thanks, Hussein, for making that distinction very clear. In a similar vein, a common question arises about Molana Hazar Imam's role, and it leads us to a related question. I've heard about the Aga Khan and some of the work that he does, but I don't know much about him. Is he like a Pope? Yeah, uh, a very common uh, comparison that is made. Um, but once again, um, it is important to differentiate between the two roles because they are quite different. And uh, Mawlan Hazramam has been asked that question many times in interviews and has, um, has spoken about these differences. Um, one of the main differences is the fact that the Imamid is a hereditary office, whereas the Pope is elected by cardinals. Also, in Islam, we don't differentiate between um, temporal or worldly matters and spiritual or religious matters. In Islam, the two deen and dunya are considered to be intertwined, inseparable. And so the Imam not only guides his community, his followers on religious matters, um, but also provides guidance on matters of this world and also works towards the improvement of the quality of life of his community and those who live amongst them works towards the security of those communities. And similarly, in regards to his own life, the Imam is not expected to retreat or withdraw from worldly matters. And in fact, it's quite the contrary. Great, thanks a lot for um, creating that differentiation for us. It's really important to understand that. And, um, you know, it is something that may be hard to articulate sometimes uh, when we get ask that question. So thank you. It's very useful for us to be able to um, now have a better way to um, differentiate and to articulate that. Our next question again touches on the role of the Imam. Why is the Aga Khan as a spiritual leader involved in business affairs? Yeah, so similar to the previous point and, and the previous question is that sometimes um, we take notions of what a spiritual leader ought to look like and we try to apply that to Islam whereas in the notion of spiritual leadership in Islam is is quite different and so uh, once again let's hear some words from Malana Hazri Imam on this matter 
The authority of the Ismaili Imam is spiritual rather than temporal in nature. At the same time, Islam believes fundamentally that the spiritual and material worlds are inextricably connected. This means that the Imam of the time also has a responsibility for improving the quality of life, the quality of worldly life, for his people and for the peoples among whom the Ismailis live. It is to advance those responsibilities that so much of my attention over these 60 years has been committed not only to strengthening the Imamat's capacities to fulfill its mandate, but also to the work of what we now call the AKDN, the Archan Development Network. So hopefully this belief in the intertwining of the temporal and spiritual realms is starting to make more sense. Um, it, it does cause some confusion uh, when looking at it from a perspective or from a background outside of Islam. And um, I think once people do understand this a little better, it becomes more obvious as to what the role of the Imam really is. And, um, and many questions become more simpler to understand. So again, going to this aspect of, of business, the, the Prophet himself was engaged in many aspects of life, including business. And so what is important is the way that money is earned, the way that these business businesses are carried out. And by that, I mean in ethical means. What's also important is how that money is used. And so the Imam guides us not only to strive for spiritual success, but at the same time to not detach ourselves from responsibilities of this material world. And he guides us to strive for success in this material world, but not for the objective of wealth and power, but rather to use those resources to help others. And um, I think the last point that is important to touch on is the fact that many times we confuse businesses of the AKDN, and by that I mean companies under the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development. Uh, many times we are, are confused about the objectives of these companies. Yes, they are for profit, but the, those profits are reinvested in the countries which they reside. And if you look at the industries that many of these companies are in, they are strategically chosen to help the development of those countries. So whether that means that there's investments made in communications, um, in the financial sector, in tourism, or in media, um, these are all, again, specifically for to help promote and stabilize the economic development of such countries. Well, thanks for framing that, um, because I think that sometimes people do feel conflicted internally um, about their success. And, um, you know, I, I think sort of the takeaway from this is that, you know, if we are all successful, we can help others and um, everyone can, you know, um, have the quality of life that um, Islam really uh, teaches us about. So um, and to take care of others. So I, I think that's really helpful to frame it in that way. Um, but let's return to Ismailis and Imam for a moment. We have a question that may also be rooted in a lack of correct understanding. And the question is this. I understand the Ismailis had an empire in certain periods of history, and this gave rise to the term assassins. Is that true? Um, yeah, so maybe we'll start with the first point. The Ismailis have led a couple empires or states, and so the first being the Fatimid Empire. Uh, Fatimid Empire is known for a few things. It's known for um, the great contributions that were made during that time to the knowledge society of that time through academic institutions that were founded by the Fatimids, such as Dar al-Ilm, such as Al-Azhar. Uh, the Fatimid Empire is also known for its pluralistic and meritocratic governance. Um, it's also known for founding and building the city Al-Qahira, which today is known as, as Cairo. 
And after this period in our history, um, the next period is commonly referred to as the, the Alamut period. And it is during this time frame that there are some legends and some myths that have been mixed up with facts and with reality. And um, some of this is due to travelers um, such as Marco Polo that came um, or that uh, some say perhaps came to, to this area during that time period. But um, recent academic research has shown that um, this actual term assassins being used to refer to the Ismailis, the, the source of that were actually from communities or empires or individuals that were hostile to the Ismailis at that time. And so it's really important to understand the context of that time period. Um, the Ismaili state was comprised of various fortresses around what present day we call Iran and Syria. Um, but outside those fortresses were different empires, different communities, and some of them were hostile to the Ismailis. And so um, there were conflicts that did take place. Again, it was a complex time of various empires. It was a time of the Crusades and the Ismaili castles were many times threatened, sometimes actually attacked. And so there was, there were incidents of self-defense and that's something that should be uh, remembered. And it's something that is many times overlooked. And if you step back and if you look at the Alamut period um, in context of our whole history, you will see that um, our Imams have always promoted and have always tried to choose peace. Um, if you look at the work of Malana Hazir Imam, if you look at some of the decisions that were made during the time of Malana Sultan Muhammad Shah, for example, while he was the lead of the League of Nations, even if you go back in time even further to the early days of Islam, where the Muslims were defending themselves quite often. So again, um, that's point number one, is the point about self-defense and about first choosing peace. Um, point number two, which I think is very important, is that unfortunately, when the Alamut period is talked about or written about, um, they don't quite, they don't often mention the fact that these fortresses were homes to some of the great libraries of those times, home to observatories that would welcome scholars from different faiths and backgrounds. Um, so yeah, hopefully those two points help um, provide a bit more light around the Alamut period and this term assassins. Well, it sure does because um, you've painted a really brilliant picture for us to be able to understand the context of the time and the complexities uh, that Ismailis were facing and, you know, how information is shared and, and documented over time. Um, you know, it, it can be misinterpreted for sure. And that, you know, amongst all of that um, misunderstanding, there's lots of evidence showing that um, the Ismailis have been part of creating um, information and sharing knowledge and building capacity globally and lots and lots of lessons for us to take away from that. So thank you so much. Um, you know, it, it does kind of lead into some of the, the misconceptions um, that we have in present day when we start to think about you know, like 9-11, for example, um, and how that may have contributed to some of the misperceptions around Islam and the association in some people's minds between the two. Which leads us to our next question. Why do we hear so often about Islamic militants? Does the Quran incite people to violence? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, as you, as you know, this is also a common question. I think it speaks to world events over the last couple decades, but also speaks to a general misunderstanding of Islam itself as a faith. And so um, let's hear some words from Mawlana Hazir Imam on the matter. Well, there is, a, a, without any doubt, a growing sense amongst Muslim communities around the world that there are forces at play that it doesn't control, but which 
does view the Muslim world uh, with, let's say, unhappiness or more. I would simply say, however, that if you analyze the situation, I don't think you can conclude that all Muslims from all backgrounds are part of that, of that phenomenon. Secondly, if you go back and look at that, you will find that a lot of the causes of those communities are people where there's a long-standing, unresolved political crisis. You, it, it's very, very risky, I think, to interpret these situations as being specific to the faith of Islam. It is specific to peoples, sometimes ethnic groups, but it's not specific to the faith of Islam. With all due respect, if you look at the crisis in the Middle East, uh, that crisis was born at the end of the First World War. The crisis in Kashmir was born through the freedom of the Indian continent. These are political issues originally, they're not religious issues. You can't attribute the faith of Islam to them. I think the second point I would make is this tendency to generalize Islam. There are many different interpretations of Islam. As a Muslim, if I said to you that I didn't recognize the difference between a Greek Orthodox or a Russian Orthodox or a Protestant or a Catholic, I think you'd say to me, but you don't understand the Christian world. Well, let me reverse that question. So you see, peace is a central value in Islam. Peace was central to the message that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his progeny, was, was delivering. Today, there's over 1.7 billion Muslims in the world that are living in a variety of contexts. And as Hazir Imam mentioned, living in a variety of political situations. Um, some of these political situations involve land disputes. Some of these situations and contexts um, involve various historical cultural traditions. Um, within this 1.7 billion Muslims, there's a wide range of economic situations, um, quality of life, um, a wide range of various issues, as you can imagine, for such a large um, group of people. And some of these other factors that are involved in these various contexts um, actually overpower the teachings of the faith itself. And sometimes there are acts that are carried out which are a result of these other factors, such as the political situation or such as the land situation. And then the faith itself is simply used to justify those acts when in fact they have nothing to do with Islam itself. Yes, and it's really unfortunate that happens, that those lines tend to get blurred in people's minds. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It really has nothing to do with faith and, and more about um, other, other factors for sure. And this is a really difficult one for people to, uh, to be able to articulate. So um, I think this provides us uh, something that we can sink our teeth in and be able to help to express uh, ourselves and our faith. And thank you for that. Uh, this does lead us to a question we seem to get quite often as well. I understand that the Aga Khan Development Network is designed to improve quality of life. Is that for smileys only? Um, good question. Um, for this, once again, let's hear what um, Moulin Hazram has to say about the AKDN. The AKDN, as we call it, is composed of a variety of private, non-governmental, non-denominational agencies, implementing many of the imamate's responsibilities. We are active in the fields of economic development, job creation, education, health care, as well as important cultural initiatives. Most of our AKDN activities have been born from the grassroots of developing countries, reflecting their aspirations and their fragilities. Through the years, of course, 
this landscape has changed fundamentally. With the creation of new states like Bangladesh, the horrors of ethnic cleansing in Uganda, the collapse of the Soviet empire, and the emergence of new countries with large Ismaili populations, such as Tajikistan. More recently, of course, we have faced the conflicts in Afghanistan and in Syria. But through all of these experiences, the Ismaili peoples have demonstrated an impressive capacity to persevere and to progress. Our work has always been people-driven. It grows out of the age-old Islamic ethic, committed to goals with universal relevance, the elimination of poverty, access to education, and social peace in a pluralist environment. The AKDN's fundamental objective is to improve the quality of human life. So, although the AKDN is inspired by the ethics of Islam, and although it is a vehicle for which the Imam carries out his mandate to improve the quality of life of the community and those who live around them, um, AKDN itself is not a religious institution, and by no means is the work of the AKDN only for Ismailis. Um, in fact, every country that the AKDN works in, Ismailis are a minority. And in fact, there are some countries where the AKDN is present, where there are little or no Ismailis. That's amazing. Um, the work that the Aga Khan Development Network does touches um, many, many people across the globe. And uh, there's a lot of beneficiaries. And I think that um, you know, we're so fortunate to be able to have that um, and to be able to be involved in that and to help and serve others. Um, here's another interesting question, Hussein. Uh, what is the difference between a mosque and a jama'at khana? Yeah, so um, Malan Hazram has actually spoken about the difference between these two places of prayer. Um, a few times, and um, especially when um, speaking at a foundation stone laying of a um, Jamaat Khana or openings of Ismaili centers. So let's take a look at one of those clips right now. At this juncture, perhaps it would be appropriate to situate one of the functions of the Ismaili center in the tradition of Muslim piety. For many centuries, a prominent feature of the Muslim religious landscape has been the variety of spaces of gathering coexisting harmoniously with the masjid, which in itself has accommodated a range of diverse institutional spaces for educational, social, and reflective purposes. Historically serving communities of different interpretations and spiritual affiliations, these spaces have retained their cultural nomenclatures and characteristics from Ribat and Zawiya to Kanaka and Jamaat Kana. The congregational space incorporated within the Ismaili center belongs to the historic category of Jamaat Kana, an institutional category that also serves a number of sister Sunni and Shia communities in their respective contexts in many parts of the world. Here, it will be a space reserved for traditions and practices specific to the Shia Ismaili Tariqah of Islam. So the two places of worship actually coexist. Um, one of them, the masjid or the mosque, is for Muslims of various interpretations and in parallel, to the existence of the masjid are a variety of other sacred places, um, places of worship for various communities within Islam. And many times these other places of worship are actually reserved for the traditions and practices of the respective communities. Um, the, the word tariqa refers to 
practices of some of these communities within Islam. Um, so, for example, um, Sufi tariqas. There are many Sufi tariqas, many Sufi communities and their specific practices. And for the Ismaili tariqa and for the Ismaili Jamaat Khana, um, it's for those who have given bayat, baya or allegiance to the Ismaili Imam. And so this touches on another question that comes up quite often as is and the question is why are Ismailis only allowed in Jamaat Khanas during times of prayer? And again, going back to the fact that it's not something that is unique for to the Ismaili Tariqa. There are other places of worship that are specifically for practices of those Tariqas. But uh, another way of looking at it, which I find really helpful, is um, a metaphor that I've heard be used. And it's a metaphor that compares a uh, place of worship to a family home. Um, my home, your home, um, homes of families around the world. And if you look at the family home, we have guests that come in, um, perhaps not during COVID, but at other times, uh, guests and loved ones who, who come in, who we spend time with um, in various places within the home. But when there are times where we want to have a family discussion, so for example, if there's something that um, my parents want to speak to me about, maybe my father wants to give me advice on something or my mother wants to encourage me about something, generally, those conversations happen when there's just family that's there. And that's okay. Um, that notion of um, wanting privacy for such matters is okay. Um, not only in the family unit, but also in the community unit. Wow, I really love that metaphor of family. It's really helpful and it, um, it really does feel, um, you know, uh, it feels really comfortable and, 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 you know, that, uh, your privacy, you know, is something that we respect and family is something that we cherish. And, uh, the place of worship is something that we cherish and, um, we respect privacy there as well. So I think that is a really great metaphor. Thank you. Glad. Um, yeah, and maybe I'll just add that, you know, if we look at various question, the various questions that were asked today, um, it's obvious that, we many times try to um, better understand and articulate our identity or the role of the Imam by comparing it to other communities or by comparing it to other uh, figures of authority or positions of authority. But again, sometimes it's okay that it's not necessarily comparable. And sometimes we don't have to look so far to be able to better understand our beliefs or our identity. Um, sometimes it can be closer to home. You know, another example that I like to use is sometimes we're asked about why we keep a picture of the Imam close to us, you know, whether it's on our desk at work or uh, on a wall at home. And again, here, I think that we can use the metaphor of family um, for it's similar to the reasons as to why we keep pictures of our family members close to us. Um, it's because that picture represents um, a notion of identity for us. Uh, the picture represents love. Um, and looking at it reminds us of something or someone that is dear to us. Again, painting a wonderful picture for us. And uh, I think that it warms all of our hearts. It certainly warms my heart. So thank you for that. And uh, I also want to thank you so much for taking the time today to um, answer these commonly asked questions. You've done a brilliant job and it really helped me to understand and I'm sure um, others who are watching to really understand how we can better articulate who we are as the smileys and to um, be a better ambassador of our faith as well. Um, and, you know, to gently but respectfully correct mis 
perceptions or misunderstandings that others may have of us or our faith. And of course, there's so much, um, you know, to it than this, but, you know, it's a wonderful start and there's so many resources available for us to continue our, our learning journey. And so thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to, you know, seeing you again soon. Yes, you too. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much, Hussein, for those thoughtful responses and for helping us to become better ambassadors of our faith. Before we move to our beloved musical expressions, a couple of announcements. Be sure to tune in to Friday Night Reflections next week for the first in a mini series entitled From the Heart with President Amir Kasamlaka on the soft skills needed to succeed in today's world. And watch out for Camp Odyssey, an exciting new virtual program for Ismaili youth aged 14 to 17 from across Canada. Camp Odyssey is a virtual camp that will take place on two consecutive weekends in March. Applications are currently being accepted for participants and counsellors. For more details, visit iicanada.org. We end our show tonight as always with our much loved musical expressions. The first is a piece called Zayur by Minelli. Jamal, who performed at the Aga Khan Museum Lapis Ball in September 2020. You will see how his solo acoustic guitar performance mesmerized the audience and crossed cultural boundaries, drawing on Western and Eastern influences to bring his signature music to life. The second piece is titled Noor by the group Concord and is a beautiful original composition by a trio from the United States. The lyrics contain themes of divine light and the song features an English translation of Ayat An-Nur from the Quran. It's been a pleasure to host you today. I was so honored to have been asked to host the show. It is a way that we all feel connected each Friday. Wishing you all the best for 2021. Ya Ali Madad.
Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah.